Please turn with me in your Bible then to 1 Peter chapter 3 as we continue our verse by verse study through the first epistle of Peter. 1 Peter 3, 19 and 20, reading from God's holy word. By whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. Let's pray. Our dearly Father, this is the word of truth, authored by the Spirit of truth, through men that were carried along or moved by the Holy Spirit. I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you as the divine instructor, gracious Lord, that you'd be forever near. Teach us to love your sacred word and view our Savior there. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Dave Direct, D D excuse me, <laughs> Dave Dravecki was a professional baseball player for the San Francisco Giants and he had cancer in his pitching arm. You probably remember his story. Curtailed his baseball career. In fact, one time he was pitching, he broke his arm while he was pitching. Dave Derecki used to get up in the middle of the night screaming as an amputee. Pain in the arm that was amputated. And yet he had excruciating pain in that arm. Not unique to amputees. And through that excruciating pain, and through his experience as a professional baseball player, God used him immensely in spreading the gospel. One day a friend of his came up to him and said, Dave, imagine this, that in heaven there are two rooms. One is filled with all of the people that you witnessed to and led to saving faith in Christ. Through all of your anguish and your suffering, your cancer that you went through. The other room is empty. In that empty room there, you, at that same time, you didn't go through cancer. You had a very successful baseball career. Long, successful career. Looking back, Dave, on your life, which room would you opt for? Without hesitation, Dave Drebecki said, I will take cancer in my amputated arm, the suffering any day of the week, for the good that Christ has worked through it, and leading many to saving faith in himself. You know, Peter wrote to a bunch of suffering saints, too. They were trying to minister through their suffering to the ungodly around them. We already, in context, looked at chapter 3, 13 through 17, where Peter told those suffering saints in Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, which is modern-day Turkey, an area of about 300 square miles, 300,000 square miles. And Peter told them that there was blessing through the suffering. There was blessing through the suffering. And now he gets to chapter 3, verses 18 through 22. And he says there's blessing through suffering. Oh, look to Christ, the example of Christ. You think of Hebrews 5, 8. Yet they learned he obedience through the things which he suffered. And remember in the New Testament that sonship is evidenced by obedience. Sonship is evidenced by obedience. Matthew 10, 24 and 25. Jesus said, The servant is not above a master. The, dis the disciple is, is not above his teacher. It's enough for the student to be like his master and the disciple like his Lord. If they called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more those of his own household? In chapter 1, verses 10 and 11 of 1 Peter, of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully 
what manner of time the Spirit of Christ was indicating, and when he testified beforehand of the sufferings of Christ and the glory that would follow. Suffering is indeed the biblical pathway to glory. Christ evidenced that. These saints there in Pontius, Galatia, and Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, they were to evidence also, and that's also written for you and I. That's to be evidenced in our lives also. 1 Thessalonians 3.3, 3, that you be not soon shaken by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that we were called to this. Look to the Lamb of God, look to the Lamb of God. For he alone is able to save you, look to the Lamb of God. When Satan tempts and doubts and fears assail, look to the Lamb of God. You and his strength shall over all prevail. Look to the Lamb of God. Hebrews 12, 2, it says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy was, that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. And in the Greek, that means you look away from everything else. And you keep your eyes focused on Jesus. You keep looking to Jesus. Our text here cites the cost of our salvation. It's costly grace that leads to blessing. And if this text exalts Christ's victory over death, devil, sin in the world, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Is that true in our lives? I know he holds the future. He rules, he reigns, he controls. He permits the suffering, and through the suffering, he brings blessings, and he brings glory to himself, first of all, and to his disciples. You know, we have a situation today that doesn't evidence a radical conversion the radicalness of new birth. Christ was a revolutionary when he walked this sod. He was a radical. He evidenced in his disciples and that in new birth there was to be a transformation where you evidenced that you were not conformed to this world. And by not being conformed, you would incur the wrath of this world, that it automatically comes with the territory. Last week we put in our library Dietrich Bonhoeffer's, Bonhoeffer's book, The Cost of discipleship. I challenge you, encourage you, read that book. It brings out the defective theology of cheap grace that is in our culture today. Forgiveness without repentance. Baptism without church discipline. Communion without confession. Grace without the cross and shed blood. Grace without the lordship of Jesus Christ, the incarnate glorified God-man. When you and I come to saving faith in Jesus Christ, we do not make him Lord when we choose. Sometime later after our repentance, as it says in the Lordship Salvation Controversy that was spawned in Dallas Theological Seminary in the 1990s. No. Colossians 2.6 says, As you have therefore received the Lord Jesus Christ, so walk ye in him. And when you see Lord in the New Testament, that refers to Jesus Christ. The name that is exalted above every name in Philippians 2, 9 through 11 is Lord. It isn't Jesus there, it's Lord. Jesus is there. Yahweh. He's God. Very God. King of kings and Lord of lords. What did Peter say in his Pentecostal sermon to the Jews? Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that this same Jesus whom you have crucified is both Lord and Christ. Acts 2.36. Bonhoeffer says this, Costly grace is the treasure hidden in the field. For the sake of it, a man will gladly go and sell all that he has. It's the pearl of great price to buy which the merchant will sell all his goods. It's the kingly rule of Christ for though whose sake a man will pluck out the eye which causes him to stumble. It's the call of Christ at which the disciple leaves his nets, forsakes everything, follows him. Costly grace is the gospel which must be sought again and again, the gift which must be asked for, the door at which a man must knock. Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow, and it's grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. A.W. Tozer, who died in 1963, the 
Missionary Alliance pastor in the pursuit of God, that classic book of his. There's another one you should read. He says this, the doctrine of justification by faith, the biblical truth and blessed relief from sterile legalism and unavailing self-effort has in our time fallen into evil company and been interpreted by many in such manner as actually to bar men from the knowledge of God. The whole transaction of religious conversion is made mechanical. It's been made mechanical and spiritless. Faith may now be exercised without a jar to the moral life and without embarrassment to the Adamic ego. Christ may be received without creating any special love for him and the soul of the receiver. The man is saved, he has in quotes, but he's not hungry or thirsty after God. In fact, he's specifically taught to be satisfied and encouraged to be content with less. Does that sum up much of professing Christianity today? And my prayer for us today as we look at this text, that God would open our eyes through his spirit of truth to the glories that transpired when Christ was on the cross, that we glory in God's sovereignty over all things, that he's able to bring victory out of seemingly insurmountable odds in the clutches of defeat. I just love the movie, The Passion of Christ. And how they portray there what happened at the cross. And how that victory that Satan seemed to have within his grasp, how it was taken out of him, and how he is just so utterly torn to pieces when he realizes the victory that Christ has achieved at the cross. Christ triumphed through his suffering on the cross. And you and I are more than conquerors through him who loved, loved us. And by persevering faith, you and I can reign as kings and priests with him. Remember what he said in Revelation 3, 21 and 22. To him who overcomes will I grant to sit with me in my throne, as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. May we worship him, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In Revelation 1, 5, and 6, who loved us, washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests to God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now, before we get into this text today, I'm going to have a little disclaimer here. The interpretation of these verses has been very controversial. Very controversial. You know what Martin Luther said on these verses? Martin Luther says, this is such a wonderful text, but a more obscure passage in Scripture you'd be hard to find. And Martin Luther says, the interpretation of it, I don't have a clue. Now that's Martin Luther. I don't exactly agree with the last part. I think we can interpret without this. And you have to remember the first horizon. Peter wrote this to persecuted saints. They weren't college graduates. They weren't high school graduates. Many of them were illiterate, no formal education whatsoever. And yet he wrote these doctrinal truths to them. And they had some understanding of the situation to which Peter was referring to. And it was meant to be an encouragement to them through their suffering. So there's value in it for us also. Romans 15, 4. Whatsoever things are written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. But we're going to approach this very humbly without dogmatism. We're seeking the Spirit's illumination, guidance. We desire only that the Godhead would be glorified. And if you leave here today, friends, with no understanding of this text at all. The fault is mine. And please forgive me. Isaiah 28.10 says, as we look at this text, remember, it's line upon line, line upon line, precept upon precept, precept upon precept. Hopefully, if you don't understand it all, at least there'll be building blocks here that you can build on and work through. With that in mind, take the handout that you have in your bulletin. This morning we're going to address, the first point is what happened? I'm going to deal with questions. Who were the spirits? What did he proclaim to them? When did this heinous sin occur? 
And the second point is, so what? Why did it happen? What's the meaning of it for us? Now, as we look at this, this is going to be, first of all, I've written a bunch of relevant scripture verses. These are verses that I used in studying in a grasping meaning of what these two verses in 1 Peter 3 mean. I give you this list so that you can take this home, have a personal study of this, sit down, go through these verses, may God's Spirit illumine your mind in them, and then apply them to the text and get a cohesiveness out of it all. But I'm going to run through these just very quickly as a kind of a survey of it all first. First, Ephesians 4, 8, and 10. Ephesians 4, 8, and 10. It says there that he who descended, Christ, is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens and the earth that he might fill all things. It says in verse 8 of Ephesians 4, now that he ascended, but that first he also descended into the lower parts of the earth. There are many scholars when they look at that, they, say, they tell you, oh, it's just John 3.13. No man hath ascended up to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, who's in heaven. So Christ was in heaven, he descended to the earth, and then he ascended back to heaven. That's what they say it means here in Ephesians 4.8. He descended first into lower parts of the earth. That is absolutely false. Absolutely false. The earth is distinct from the lower parts of the earth. The ancient Semites, the ancient Jews, what they looked at when they looked at the world as created, they looked at it as a big house, a three-tiered structure. What you had was the upper structure of it. They divided into three parts. The first part, the upper part, was where the gods resided. And then the middle part was the earth, made for humans by the gods. And then the third part was the lower part, that was a big cavernous cave, dark, silent place. And that was Sheol. That was the grave. That was the netherworld. That was the place for the dead and for the demonic spirits. That was the lowest part of the earth. Okay? That was the lowest part of the earth. Now, Psalm 139, 15. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and scarcely wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. What that means there is the psalmist is drawing a parallel to your birth in the womb to being in the lowest parts of the earth. From this standpoint, the parallelism, when you are in your mother's womb, it's dark. It's a secret place to be. The same goes for the lowest parts of the earth the cavernous part of the earth there, that cavernous cave. If you've ever been in a cave, uh, Nance and I were one in Kentucky once. They called it the preacher's loft there. And what they did was they got all the tour people in there. And when you were back in there, the preacher got up above everybody else on the plateau there. Then they turned the lights out. He had a very captive audience. <laughs> First Samuel 28. You remember that, the witch at Endor? What happened was Saul there, he had the Philistines all against him. He was quaking in his boots. What happened was God didn't answer him by dreams or thuman or anything. And Samuel had died, so he went to the witch of Endor. He had cast them out of Judah, but he went to the witch at Endor. And she says, what shall I do for you? And he says, bring up Samuel. Well, she brought up Samuel. What did she do in her actions? What she probably did in her actions was the witch at Endor bent over this medium, this spiritist woman, bent over... And what she did was, just like you'd have a little dog, say, burying his bone in the yard, dug up the dirt there, made out a little shallow hole there and that. And that's how she brought Samuel up then. She was making contact with the underworld. The underworld. She all there, the lowest parts of the earth. Luke 23, 46, Christ's spirit. What did he do? Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And then he breathed at the last. Okay. Christ's spirit is eternally alive, never died. But Christ's body did die, and the body went to the tomb. But the spirit didn't. Okay. Psalm 16, 8 through 10, whose spirit here? 
Verse 10, for you will not leave my soul in Sheol, that means the grave, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Well, whose spirit here is David referring to? Well, you look at Acts 2, 24, 29 to 31. Jesus' soul was not left in Hades. You look at verse 24, God raised up Jesus, loosened the pains of death. It's not possible that death should hold him. And uh, verse 29 says in Jerusalem, there David's tomb was there and it was still there. David's tomb was there and it's still there. So David there saw corruption. David saw corruption, but Jesus' body did not see corruption. Jesus' body did not see corruption. It says his soul was not left in Hades. Remember, that's a temporary place. Temporary place. Um, Act John 11, 17 to 39. Remember what uh, Martha said about her brother Lazarus? After four days, it says he stinketh. Jesus, why get him out of the tomb? He stinketh. Well, the Jews believed that your body could be in the tomb three days, and then on the fourth day, it stinketh. It stinketh. Three days, and then the fourth day, it stinketh. And of course, Jesus, we know, three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Uh, it can be parts of three days in that, Matthew 12, 39, 40 in that. So Jesus, their body was in the grave, parts of three days. Isaiah 14, 15. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest parts of the pit. When we deal with Sheol, it means the grave. We deal with progressive revelation. You go from, in the Bible, progressive revelation. More and more is revealed to us about then where the souls go when they die. It starts out with Sheol, which is the grave. Then it goes to Hades. Think of Luke 16, 19 to 31, Lazarus and Dives. Hades means the unseen place, the unseen place. And then Jesus talked about hell as what? Gehenna, uh, Mark 9, where the worm dieth not and the fire never goes out. He Gehenna was the Jewish dump, the Jewish dump, and he likened that to hell. And hell, when you get to Revelation, hell is the lake of fire and brimstone. There's progressive revelation there on what happens to people that die. Jude verse 6 and 7 and 2 Peter 2, 4 through 6, it refers to the angels that did not keep their proper domain, left their own abode. He's reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of of the great day. And it speaks in verse 4, For God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell. That phrase, down to hell there, refers to Tartarus. Tartarus. Now Peter uses that. Tartarus. What is it? That's from Greek mythology. And it refers to the place where those people that transgressed the gods received the worst punishments, the severest punishments. So what Peter does is he likens these angels who sinned against God, left their proper domain, and we're going to connect it with Genesis 6, 1 through 4, but they received the worst punishment from God. Why? They were put in Tartarus, not an actual place uh, with that name, but Tartarus so that Peter's readers would understand it. The lowest part of Hades. The lowest part of it. The lowest part of Sheol, the netherward, netherworld and put in chains there permanently, reserved there for judgment. Genesis 6, 1 through 4. Genesis 6, 1 through 4. You know the time when the sons of God, sons of God went into the sons of men, and uh, it talks there about the... In fact, I should just look at that quickly here. Genesis. Now it came to pass, and men began to multiply on the face of the earth, Daughters were born in them. The sons of God saw the daughters of men. They were beautiful, took wives for themselves, all they chew, and the Lord said, chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for indeed his flesh, his days shall be 120 years. There were giants on the earth in those days and afterward. When the sons of God came to the daughters of men, they bore children to them. They were mighty men, old men, mighty men of old men of renown. What this is referring to here, friends, is the evil angels evil angels, and what they did was they cohabited men, okay? They cohabited men. Now, this is not Rosemary's baby, okay? I don't know how many times I read this, and I wish I had a quarter for every time I read it. Somebody said, oh, we have angels here cohabiting with humans. Oh, no, you don't. Why don't you have that? Because in Matthew 12, 
I've listed here Matthew 12, 25 and Matthew 22, 30. Angels do not marry. Angels do not have sexual relations. That is against their nature. But what happens in Genesis 4? You can have angels that leave their own domain and what do they do? They can possess. Demon possession can occur in the ungodly. You can have demon possession. And then those demon-possessed ungodly men then can go into the daughters of men, cohabit with them. And then you can have all this evil abound. And the Nephilim means the falling ones. The falling ones. Those who have the power to do great evil. They were the sons of Enoch. Giants, as it were, in those days. These offspring. And you read Genesis 6. It says they did evil continually. That's all he did. And the earth was corrupted by it. And God's response was what? To save eight souls, as it were, out of water. This is devil's plan. To destroy God's plan of redemption that was revealed in Genesis 3.15. There will be enmity between Satan and between the woman, Israel, and her seed and Satan's seed. And God's seed would bruise Satan's head and Satan would bruise this woman's seed heel. This is the plan of Satan then, you see to thwart God's plan of redemption. Just like during the time of Joash in 2 Chronicles 22, just at, at the time of Jesus' temptation, Matthew 4, 1 through 11, just at the time of Jesus' crucifixion, in Matthew 26 through 28, you have the same type of effort by Satan, always trying to thwart God's plan of redemption. And then when you get in Numbers 13 to 33, remember the spies there, that we were like grasshoppers in their sight. These were like Nephilim. By the way, friends, those weren't the descendants of the Nephilim in Genesis 6. Why? Because of the flood. The flood destroyed everybody except Noah. And they ate souls there. So these were people who were like the Nephilim of old. They weren't the actual Nephilim descendants. Job 1, 21, 26, sons of God, refers only to holy angels. Only holy angels. The sons, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves, the sons of God came to present themselves before God, and Satan came also among them. See the distinction there between the sons of God and Satan. Sons of God refers to holy angels. And then I've already started Mark 12, 25, Matthew 22, 30. Judges 5, 12 is Barak and Deborah's time where they freed the captives. Freed the captives. So when you look at Jesus there, his action in Ephesians 4, 8 through 10, what did he do when he led captivity captive? Is Jesus went down and he preached to the spirits in prison. That's the negative thing he did. The positive thing he did was he preached to the good saints, the saints that were in paradise, the upper compartment of Hades. Hades has two compartments. The upper compartment is paradise. The lower compartment there is the lower part where the ungodly go, and the lowest of the low there is Tartarus. And then Luke 16, 26 says there's an irreversible gulf in between. So you can't pass from one to the other. So Jesus went down. He preached to the spirits in prison there, announced his triumph over those demonic evil spirits. At the same time then, Jesus also emptied paradise, the upper compartment, and then in his triumph, he led captivity captive. When he ascended, he went into heaven. His spirit then ascended, he went into heaven, took those captives with him. So now, when you and I think of you and I now that die, do you and I then as an Old Testament saint? No, we're New Testament. Old Testament saints went to paradise, which is the upper compartment of, Sa of Hades. Where do you and I go? 2 Corinthians 5.8, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. You and I go to the third heaven where God is, which is now paradise. And that's exactly what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, 1 through 4, that I've listed here. Where now he says, I know a man 14 years ago, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. But he was caught up to the third heaven. This man, whether he's in the body, I do not know. He says in verse 4, he was caught up to paradise. The third heaven where God dwells is the same as where paradise is now. So you and I then, when we die, our body goes to the tomb, still united with Christ, but our spirit immediately goes to glory, to paradise, to the third heaven, to be with God. Okay. And then Matthew 25, 40, or Matthew, Revelation 20 there, 1 and 2 and 7, Satan is in prison uh, there before the millennium begins the thousand-year millennium in Revelation chapter 20. He's imprisoned. It's the same place 
where those demons are imprisoned in the bottomless pit, the abuso in Revelation 9, 1 and 2. And then after the thousand years there, Satan is released from his prison. But this prison is the same thing as the bottomless pit, the abyss, this subterranean area, the Sheol and that that we're talking about. Now, Matthew 25, 41, it says there, he will say to those, Christ will say to on his left hand, depart from me, cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Friends, mark this down. This is in the perfect tense in the Greek, which means it happened in the past. It has a continuing, ongoing result. Hell is created. Hell is created already, but it's not occupied now. Hell is created already. It's not occupied now. If you are a saint of God and you die, your body goes to the tomb, you're united with Christ, but your spirit goes to paradise to be with God, third heaven. If you are an ungodly person and you die, you go to the tomb, but your spirit goes well. Where? Not to hell. It goes to the lowest part of Hades, where the ungodly are kept. Okay? Now, Revelation 19 and 20. The first inhabitants of hell, who are they? The first inhabitants of hell are the beast and the false prophet. The beast and the false prophet. Revelation 20, 14 and 15. A thousand years later, Satan, or Revelation 20, 10, excuse me. Revelation 20, 10, Satan's eternal abode. At the end of the millennium, Satan is cast into that fire and brimstone where who are? The beast and the false prophet are, and they are still alive. So the Bible does not teach annihilation. No annihilation. The Bible does not teach. When you die as an ungodly person, you cease to exist. No, you don't. You permanent existence. You go to, you see, lower Hades first. Someday you'll go to the lake of fire and brimstone forever, forever, and ever and ever. That's why Matthew 28, 10, 28 says, You fear not those who kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. Rather, you fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Revelation 20, 14, and 15. Death and Hades were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. Anyone not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. So notice the order. The first occupants of hell were the beast and the false prophet. A thousand years later was Satan. Then it's death and Hades. And then it's the un, all the un, un, ungodly dead in body and spirit that have been resurrected out of the lower part of Hades. They will also be in the lake of fire and brimstone forever and ever. And I don't want you, us to end on pessimism, so I put 1 Peter 3.22 and Colossians 2.15. Christ has gone into heaven, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. He's at the right hand of God. There's victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my praises do him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Christ has victory over all the angelic forces. Now, that's just a background. Now, let's go to our text. Point one. What happened? What happened? Verse 19. By which also. This refers back to verse 18. Christ was put to death in the flesh, and then there's no definite article in the Greek there, but made alive by the Spirit. There's no definite article there. My version has the Spirit. But in the Greek, there's no definite article. So you could say he was put to death in the flesh, but his spirit was alive. His spirit was alive, small s. Jesus' spirit was alive. Luke, uh, Luke uh, 23, 46. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And then he gave up. His, uh, then he died, see. Then he ceased this life. So, by which also. So he's dead in the flesh, his flesh is in the tomb. His body's in the tomb. But his spirit is alive. So what, what's his spirit doing? The word there says he also went. And the went in the Greek means he moves from one place to another. Jesus' spirit is on the move between his death and resurrection. Okay? His spirit is on the move between his death and resurrection. His body's in the tomb, parts of three days and three nights. But his spirit is on the move. He went and preached to the spirits in present. Now, the word for preached here is caruso. It's not euangelizo. Euangelizo refers to the gospel. Caruso means a herald or a proclamation. You remember in the medieval times, a king had a herald, and he'd go to the county square, 
And then he'd say, hear ye, hear ye. And he'd open up, you know, on the scroll and what the king had to say. Well, he's representing the king. He's the herald. He makes a proclamation. That's what Jesus is doing. He's proclaiming there. There's no gospel here for these spirits that are in prison. Why? Why? It says here, he preached to the spirits in prison. If it's humans in prison, it's suke in the Greek. Souls, human beings. But this is spirits, which is pneumatasin. Pneumatasin. He's speaking to spirits in prison. Well, spirits in prison are demonic spirits, unclean spirits. Those are the spirits he's preaching to, and they're in a prison, which means a place of confinement, an actual place of confinement. And he's proclaiming to them, not the gospel. Why? Because the demons and Satan, somebody says, why don't we pray for the salvation of Satan? Well, you know what? He's outside of the gospel. He's outside of the purvey of the gospel. 1 Timothy 2.5 says what? There's one mediator between man and Christ Jesus. Not between the spirits and Christ Jesus, between man and Christ Jesus. And also Hebrews 2.16, it says Jesus took on him what? Not the nature of angels. He took on him the nature of us, human beings. You and I, you see, come under the purvey of salvation, not the spirits. So when the spirits fell, in Revelation 12, 4, it says his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven. One third of the angelic host fell with Satan. They were confirmed in that fallenness forever and ever, just as the holy angels are confirmed in their holiness forever and forever. So he went and preached to these spirits in prison. Now, those spirits in prison, who are they? Who are those spirits in prison? Well, that's where we get into the verses then in Jude, verse 6, and 2 Peter 2, 4 through 6. Those spirits at which at one time did, they left their proper domain in the spirit world. And then what happened? They came down into this world. The same thing as you had Satan in Genesis 3 when he left the spirit world and he came down into the animal world and the human world and the temptation in the garden. So they left their proper domain then. And then they did this heinous sin. And then God judged them permanently for them. He confined them in chains in Tartarus, the place for the worst sinners, the worst evil, the worst place you could be for torment and punishment. He confined them there in chains forever. Now, when we think of all of these demonic spirits that are going out in the world, remember this. Satan is not bound today. We know that from 1 Peter 5, 8, and 9. But your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are accomplished are your brotherhood or in the world. He's not bound now. Contrary to what post-millennialists and non-millennialists believe, he's not bound now. Satan is loose. And we also know from Luke 8, 31 and Matthew 8, 29, that the demons, what did they say? Are you come here? They told Jesus, are you come here to, to torment us before our time? Don't cast us into the abyss. So the demons, you see, ever since this occurred with these first spirits, back in the time, I believe, and as it says in verse 20, in the time of Noah when this occurred, ever since then, periodically, God has been taking some demons and say, hey, because of that heinousness of your acts, you too are chained in Tartarus permanently forever. And the demons that are out there around that today, they know that. And they're fearful of that. You come here to torment us before the time? Are you going to cast us into the abyss? To be with those others that are already there chained permanently forever until the final judgment? Will they be cast to the lake of fire forever and ever and ever? So who were these spirits? That's those then, those demonic spirits back in the time of Noah in Genesis 6, 1 through, 1 through 4. And what happened? I'll explain that again. What happened there is they left their proper domain in the spirit world. They came down into this world. They cohabited, or excuse me, they demon-possessed then ungodly people. And then those ungodly people then went and intermingled. Intermingled with godly in that. Remember in Judges 2, it's a snare when you do that. 
the godly and the ungodly together. It's a snare. You see, when you mix pure with wicked, what happens? It tends more prone to be wicked than to be pure. That's the greatest propensity. It's true today. It's always been true. So what happened then is they produced then these offspring, these human offspring that were evil. And it became in Genesis 6, 5 that every imagination of their heart was evil and they were violent and corrupted and they corrupted the whole earth. And it got so bad, God said, I'm going to judge it. And he saved out of that just Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their wives, the eight persons alive, and that was it. God had to act then so that God's plan of redemption, you see, in Genesis 3, 15, would not be thwarted. Now, verse 20, who formerly were disobedient when once the divine song suffering waited in the days of Noah. Did it wait in the days of Noah? Long suffering, what is that? That is patience that takes the long view and endures over a long period of time. God said, in Genesis 6-3, my spirit shall not always strive with man, but the forbearance of God, the long-suffering God, how long did it last? 120 years. 120 years before the flood came. While the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight souls, and here at Suke, it refers to people now he's talking about. See, he's not talking about spirits here, pneumatas, and he's talking about souls, Suke, people. They were saved through the water, through the flood. God's plan of salvation, you see. The coming Redeemer, the Messiah, would prevail. It would not be overcome by the sinfulness of man or demonic schemes or the schemes of Satan. Now, you and I ask, so what? I've given you a lot of verses, a lot of stuff, probably a lot of you have never heard before. Remember, Isaiah 28.10. It's line upon line, line upon line, precept upon precept. I encourage you just to go through these verses. If there's questions, we'll start building on this. But why did it happen? First of all, the saints that were persecuted in Peter's day, they had connection with this. They knew when Peter referred to Tartarus, they knew what that was. They knew what that was. And remember, when you're talking Sheol and Hades and all that, that's a temporary place. Temporary place, which awaits a resurrection. Whereas if you're talking hell, that's a permanent place. That's a forever, forever, forever permanent. You never get out of there once you're in the lake of fire and brimstone. Okay. But they knew what Tartarus referred to. And per Peter referred to that, to this subterranean area, the Sheol, the grave, where then the dead were and these demonic spirits. Christ went there, and he proclaimed then victory. He proclaimed through his death on the cross his triumph over the devil, over sin, over the demons, over the flesh, over the world. It was a triumph that was proclaimed to them. And then when you, that's the negative side. To the demon spirits, that triumph was proclaimed. You see, verse 22, he has gone into heaven. That's his ascension. He is at the right hand. That's the place of power in that. Angels, authorities, and powers being made subject to Jesus. You see, Jesus is God over the demonic spirits that are out there today around. He's, he's Lord over Satan. He's Lord over all of those that are in Tartarus that are in the abyss, that are, that are in the pit. The pit. In Colossians 2.15, Jesus says there, Jesus disarmed the principalities and powers. He triumphed over them through his death on the cross. And then when you get to Ephesians 4, 8 through 10, you see, he led captivity captive and he gave gifts to men. Now that he descended, he also descended first in the lower parts of the earth. And while he was there in the lower parts of the earth, he proclaimed then his triumph over those evil spirits and all of that. And at the same time, he led captivity captive. He emptied paradise. And those godly saints that were in the upper part of Hades, he took them to the third heaven where his father is, and that's now where they reside. So if you and I die now, you and I go to paradise, the third heaven where God resides. 
the ungodly go to the lower part of Hades, where they await the time when Jesus will be crowned Lord of Lords, and on the white throne judgment, Revelation 20, 1 through 11, he will raise them from the lower part of Hades. Their bodies will be joined to their spirits, and then he will pronounce the judgment on them. Their names are not written in the book of life, and they will be cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and the devil is. And there they will reside with Hades and death forever and ever and forever. Now, is that an encouragement to a persecuted saint or not? And that message of encouragement, you see, is also meant for you and I today. Jesus is very God. He is Yahweh. He's King of kings and Lord of lords. He's Lord over Satan. This is not a dualism. If there's equality with Satan and God and we're wondering, oh, who's going to triumph? I wonder who the battle is going on in the spirit world and I don't know who's... We know the end. We triumph. We triumph through faith in Christ because Christ is the victor. Christ has triumphed over the death, Hades, and over all the demonic spirits. And in Revelation 1.18, Christ is what? I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys. I have the authority over death and Hades. Is that an encouragement to you and I today? Can we then persevere with his enabling through whatever comes our way? Before we close today, I want you to take our songbook and turn to the back. And I want us to recite in unison the Apostles' Creed. The Apostles' Creed is the very back page, and I want you and I to recite it in unison. There are many in professing Christianity today that says this should be the creed of the church. Across all denominations, this should be the creed of the church. Let's recite it together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe a holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now, friends, look at the phrase, he descended into hell. That was not in the original. That was added in 390 A.D., and in the original, it was descended in infernus. Descended in infernus. And what that means, the ancient says, he descended into Hades or the lower parts of the earth. Now, from our study today, is he descended into hell? Is that accurate or inaccurate? It is inaccurate. At no time, Jesus, who is Lord over hell, the creator of the hell, but at no place in Scripture does it ever say that Jesus descended into hell. And remember, hell is a permanent abode for those that are there. Hell currently, Matthew 25, 41, is empty. It is awaiting. Revelation 19, 20. When the beast and the false prophet will be its first occupants, and a thousand years later, in Revelation 20, 10, Satan will be there. Jesus descended into Hades, which is in a temporary abode, that lowest parts of the earth. And there he proclaimed his triumph over the demonic forces, the evil forces. And at the same time, Ephesians 4, 8 through 10, he emptied paradise and brought it to the third heaven to be with God. May we glory in that and may we glory in the truth and may the truth then be the sustenance of our daily walk 
in Christ through his Spirit's enabling. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word of truth. I pray, Dear Heavenly Father, through all of this deep doctrine that's been given today, Dear Heavenly Father, I just pray your spirit of truth that you would illuminate our minds. May we take the scriptures and meditate on them, chew on them, put them together, as it says in 2 Timothy 2.15, rightly dividing the word of truth. And may we see the unity of it all, Dear Heavenly Father. And may it lead us to glorify you to glorify our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to glory in the cross, to glory in what Christ endured for us. And dear Heavenly Father, may we exalt our risen Lord and Savior, His victory over all the forces of evil, dear Heavenly Father. And because He lives and because He reigns, we too shall live and reign, and angels will be subject to us. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.